I would like to introduce her. Dr. Rosen Karimi is a research scientist in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. She studied how environmental factors influence aquatic pollutants in freshwater and marine ecosystems, and how these pollutants impact human health. Dr. Karimi was trained in ecology and environmental health at the University of Pennsylvania and Dartmouth College. Her research has been supported by the National Institute of um, Environmental Health Sciences, the United Nations Environment Program, New York Sea Grant, and also the Lake uh, Chaplin Sea Grant. So thank you both. Thank you. Thanks everybody for making it out today. I appreciate you taking the time out of your no doubt busy schedule. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation mm -hmm. to uh, give a seminar as part of the series. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about this project uh, that is just wrapping up with collaborators um, where we did some research, obviously looking at winter mercury patterns on Lake Champlain. That's a picture of Lake Champlain. So I'll talk a lot about that. Uh, it's kind of a smaller scale project, but uh, we're wrapping up and writing up the results now and the data are really interesting. So I'm excited to share them with you today. So I promise I'll, I'll make it worth your while. Um, but I kind of wanted to start off a little bit broadly about what environmental health is in general and why we care specifically about mercury. Um, and how climate change could influence our exposure to mercury. Then I'll talk specifically about the Winter Mercury Project and some of the results that we found. There were two components to that project. One was a field study on Lake Champlain. Another one was a survey that we conducted um, and disseminated to people who collect and eat fish from the Lake Champlain region and Lake Champlain specifically. Um, and then I'll talk about the conclusions and just general implications for environmental health risks, but also for um, future studies. So what is environmental health? Um, I'm an environmental health scientist um, in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, so I study human exp exposure to pollutants in the environment and the health effects that result. Um, and so as someone who's trained in ecology, I've always focused on um, ecological factors like food web characteristics, population sizes, things like that, and how those influence levels of pollutants. Also, environmental factors like biogeochemical factors, temperature, pH, things like that, how those influence pollutants in the environment, and by extension, human exposure and health. And so for me, I focused on aquatic environments, and those range from freshwater streams, uh, rivers, lakes, wetlands, uh, also coastal and estuary ecosystems, and kind of more open water marine systems, and how those pollutants in those environments uh, affect human health. And so as an ecologist, again, I focused on the ecological and environmental factors, and how those uh, impact levels of contaminants like heavy metals, PCBs, and PFAS in aquatic food chains. And so the aquatic food chain that I've studied mostly, I don't know if pointer can come over here, is basically, uh, doesn't seem to appear so much, um, the phytoplankton or algae at the base going up to zooplankton. So that's a picture of Daphnia, which is a really common zooplankton that you see in lots of freshwater lakes all over the world. Um, and then up to fish, and of course you can add humans who eat fish onto that food chain as well. And so those ecological and environmental factors can influence those contaminant levels in the food chain and influence human exposure and toxicological effects. So that's basically where kind of my career is. And I want to focus mostly on the heavy metals because that's, that's just been the focus of my career. Um, essentially, those get released into the atmosphere through uh, a combination of industrial sources as well as natural ones. So something like mercury specifically can get uh, released into the atmosphere through coal-fired power plants, um, artisanal gold mining activities all throughout the world, but also from volcanoes and things like that. And then those get deposited into our water ecosystems and get directly taken up into the food chain, starting with phytoplankton and then on up to higher trophic levels. And so fish 
are really, uh, I think, important focus for environmental health because they represent this real puzzle whereby we have to try to solve this problem of minimizing the risks of exposure from contaminants like mercury PCBs and PFAS, but also to optimize the benefits from nutrients like omega-3 fatty acids, they're also a lean source of protein, vitamin D. So we don't wanna just discount those and dissuade people from eating fish overall. They are a really important source of those nutrients uh, in the diet kind of worldwide. So we have to figure out a way to kind of optimize uh, the nutritional benefits relative, relative to the risks. Yeah, so they represent this important um, environment, human health link. They're a source of those nutrients. They're also a source of the contaminants. And because of that, the fish consumption guidelines that are published in various ways are inherently complex and confusing. Um, <clears throat> but also what's interesting to me as a scientist is that those nutrients and contaminants are environmentally driven. And so like a lot of scientists, I started asking, well then how is climate change going to impact fish as a food source? So, for today, I'm gonna to focus on how climate can impact the quality of fish in terms of those nutrient and contaminant levels, specifically mercury. But it's also important just to kind of keep in the back of your mind that climate can also influence fish availability and access in terms of just how fish tolerate different changes to their environments, uh, temperature just being one of them. And so among all these different contaminants, mercury is perhaps the most studied uh, due to its known risks to human health. But the effects of climate change on mercury and fish is really not well known at all. Um, and so the reason why we have studied uh, fish and mercury so much is because of the known health risks. So one of the kind of earliest that known events of mercury exposure come from Minamata Bay, which you can kind of see here um, on the coast of Japan. And what happened in 1953 was uh, 25 to 30 tons of methyl mercury. I'll talk more about methyl mercury specifically soon. That was released from a factory. And what resulted was about 1,400 cases of what was then called Minamata disease, which is really just acute mercury poisoning and 380 deaths. And so this is just a list of some of the symptoms of uh, Minamata disease. So the mercury got into the sediments, then went into the fish, and then people who ate those fish got very ill. Um, a lot of these symptoms, if you look at this list, you can start to see that they're all related to the central nervous system. So ataxia is um, loss of coordination, loss of balance, um, slurred speech, speech disturbances, mental disturbances, things like that. Um, and so most people don't experience um, these levels of symptoms. For chronic exposures from eating fish, it's a little bit different. But since Minamata, we've learned a lot about mercury. We know now that it's a global persistent pollutant, so it exists all over the globe, and it persists. It doesn't just evaporate or go away, it might change its compartments on the, on the earth, um, but it's here to stay. So in addition to those neurotoxic effects, it can also have cardiovascular and immunological effects as well. A um, couple important things to know about mercury, it has a couple of, uh, has multiple chemical forms, two of which are methylmercury and inorganic mercury. Methylmercury just has, this, let me see if I can use, I don't think it works. It doesn't work as well. <laughs> okay. Well, methyl mercury really just has this methyl group attached to it. It's just that um, CH3. And that group is enough to really change how mercury behaves in the environment and in our bodies. Um, it has a higher bioavailability. That's its ability to be taken up and incorporated into the body. Um, it also has a much longer biological half-life. So that's the length of time it stays in the body once it's there. 
and it also has a higher toxicity level. And these characteristics have been demonstrated at all levels of the food chain, so literally going from algae, zooplankton, fish, and humans. So we're very confident about these characteristics scientifically. But what they all mean is that methylmercury has a higher a tendency to bioaccumulate or increase in the body over time, also biomagnify or increase um, through the food chain in concentration, and also reach toxic effects. And so this is the focus of today, is really on that methylmercury form. And most people are exposed to methylmercury from food, most of which is fish. And so as a result of knowing all that, scientists have studied mercury in fish and lakes for decades. So if you use, might appreciate this, um, you know, from the library perspective, if you use Web of Science search terms, mercury and fish or mercury and lakes, you can see that since about 1990, which is where this um, graph begins, there have been over 5,000 publications and almost 70,000 citing articles um, using those search terms. And in the mid-90s, there were some really important papers that came out really well describing bioaccumulation, bioavailability, um, transfer through the food chain. But patterns and processes of mercury during winter were really missing from that picture. So um, essentially, this is true of lakes in general. We know very little about what happens in lakes during winter time. Um, so here's just an article from The Guardian that was published in 2022 saying, why do we know so little about what happens to lakes in the winter? Um, I'll just tell you right now, you'll see a slide later that kind of shows it, because it's hard to study lakes in the winter time. There's kind of a reason. But um, this is a problem because we know that winter conditions in lakes are changing very rapidly, and we really don't know what the ramifications are. Um, so in northern climes in particular, the winter temperatures are rising faster than temperatures during the rest of the year. Um, in 2019, this paper came out in Nature Climate Change, um, citing lake ice as one of the world's resources most threatened by climate change. So why is it a resource? Well, for humans, you know, uh, it does affect our ability to, you know, go ice fishing, recreational activities, and things like that, but also transportation, uh, seasonal roads, and things like that in northern areas of the world, including Canada. Um, but I think kind of more importantly than that is that for some lakes, it's so fundamental to the environment and the ecology that to take lake ice away really dramatically changes the ecosystem, but we just don't really know how yet. And so uh, before I get into some of the details of this research, I want to show you just a picture of Lake Champlain, where it is. You can see that it spans the US-Canadian border. Um, it's also on the border of New York and Vermont. It has the same geologic history as the Great Lakes, but it's not considered a Great Lake. Um, that's a, a sore point for a lot of Vermonters, I think, is that they think it's a Great Lake, but it's not. Um, it has very well-studied ecology. Um, and as well as mercury um, research from that specifically. And if you kind of look at that zoomed in picture, you can see it's got a lot of these semi-isolated bays and inlets. Um, it's got five major basins, but all of those, the smaller bays and the larger basins, they're considered separate ecosystems. So they really do kind of have their own unique sets of characteristics. Um, also, particularly in the north, it has a lot of agricultural runoff um, and, as a result, nutrient pollution. And that, that's actually really typical globally. We see a lot more lakes that have high nutrient levels. They're considered eutrophic. Um, it's becoming more and more rare to have lakes that are considered oligotrophic. So most of the field studies that have been done in lakes were conducted in spring, summer, and fall. So here's just one example. Um, this is some research by a colleague of mine looking at mercury levels in Lake Champlain zooplankton. So here are the mercury concentrations in Mallets Bay and Missisquoi Bay going from about kind of early, late spring, early summer through the fall. And we found they found higher mercury concentrations in Mallets Bay, definitely a seasonal pattern, um, but that pattern varied between the bays. You see very different patterns in the, in the points, but you still see kind of a consistent decrease in the fall. So just lower levels in the fall in general. 
But that seasonality and differences between sites, a lot of studies have come to the conclusion that it's due to things like phytoplankton biomass, zooplankton biomass, and lake mixing or turnover. Um, also, it could be due to differences in methylmercury production and cycling between those two bays in particular. But the winter patterns are totally missing from this picture, and that's pretty typical. So I want to talk a little bit more about methylmercury and how it's produced. Um, it's produced primarily in the sediments, where bacteria convert mercury to methylmercury under anoxic or oxygen poor conditions. And those conditions vary seasonally. But once they convert it into that more toxic form, it's then available to be taken up into the food chain in the water column. Now, this is a kind of a gross oversimplification. We've actually learned a lot, I'd say, in the last 10 years about the diversity of microbes that can do this conversion, where they are within the lake ecosystem and under what conditions. So I think that there's even more to be learned about that. But still, in general, this is kind of the current paradigm of how it works. And so the conventional wisdom was that that methylmercury production and bioaccumulation that results from that is pretty negligible in winter. We almost don't even need to think about it because it's just too cold. So the thought being that temperatures are too low for microbes to be active enough to make that conversion. But since that uh, paper was published in 2006, there was a lot of evidence emerging from these kind of newer winter limnology studies that showed that there was actually some biological activity in lakes during winter that we could expect just based on first principles would support methylmercury production and bioaccumulation. So for example, studies done showing primary productivity or algal growth in lakes, if there's phytoplankton growing, then they're also able to take up mercury into their cytoplasm, right? You could expect that. Um, also, evidence showing zooplankton growth in the winter. If zooplankton's growing, they must be eating. If they're eating, they must be eating methylmercury in their food as well. So there's, you would expect methylmercury bioaccumulation to be going on in the winter too. Um, also, <clears throat> what really kind of caught my eye was evidence of microbial activity and benthic oxygen depletion under ice cover. This was uh, from a couple of studies done in Lake Champlain by uh, a colleague of mine who's a collaborator on this Lake Champlain Sea Grant study, um, <clears throat> who was actually a, a graduate student with me at the same time. And um, I contacted him and said, well, you know, this might mean that there's methylmercury production going on in winter. And we both thought it was worthwhile to, you know, submit a proposal, which we got funded um, very thankfully. And we made the argument that it was important to understand whatever was going on in wintertime, because if you want to understand bioaccumulation, which is really a year-round process, you can't just look at part, you know, compartments of time and ignore the rest. Um, so it's important in terms of understanding year-round bioaccumulation, trophic transfer, and risk to our health, but also wildlife that eats fish. Also because it's potentially sensitive to climate change. So there's a lot of climate-driven changes in lakes that are worth considering. Um, number one is that we know that we've had decreasing ice cover since about the 1950s. So if you look at this graph here, it goes back to 1860. Um, 1816 rather, all the way to 2016. And you can see that um, the ice cover occurs later and later uh, in the winter time, and it's over a shorter period of time as well. But also the frequency in which the lake didn't close at all has been increasing in recent years. So there are some winters where it just doesn't close at all. Uh, we also see increasing lake temperatures just in the water, increasing flooding, um, there could also be indirect effects from just changing biogeochemistry in the water, lake mixing. Um, so all of these things can have potential effects on mercury patterns in the food web. We don't know what they are yet, but we can guess that they're going to be pretty complex. So now we're kind of ready to shift into talking about the specific study. Um, so our goals were twofold. First was to characterize winter mercury patterns just compared to other seasons. And second, to predict the risks based on the changing 
So with that first goal, um, that's what I'm going to focus on today. We had two major questions. One is, how does methylmercury supply to the food chain in winter compare to other seasons? So I'll show you results from the field study. And then second, what's the extent to which anglers rely on eating fish caught from Lake Champlain in different seasons? And so we conducted that survey to assess fish consumption in recreational as well as subsistence anglers in that region. Because we really don't know about kind of local usage of the lake. So a little bit about the field methods. We sampled two eutrophic bays. So they're both in the North Missisquoi Bay and St. Albans Bay. These were existing monitoring sites where my collaborators had really well characterized year-round physical, biochemical, ecological factors. Um, but also we chose, we wanted to choose two eutrophic lakes because they represent lakes globally. Um, like I said before, they're becoming more common. So it's good to have at least more than just one picture of what it might look like in a eutrophic system. And so when you look at these kind of figures here for each bay, that shaded um, jagged area on the top shows the excess phosphorus level in that bay over time. And so you can see that Missisquoi Bay has a lot more excess phosphorus than St. Albans Bay, but they both have excess phosphorus, right? So they both have nutrient pollution. But there are some important differences between the bays, that being one of them. So Missisquoi Bay is more highly eutrophic, higher phosphorus, greater potential for anoxia or those low oxygen levels to develop. Um, it's shallower. It has those um, cyanobacteria blooms more often. It gets a lot more input from the surrounding watersheds. You can see how much land area there is around it. Whereas St. Albans Bay is really more kind of connected to this big region, which is known as the Inland Sea. Um, and so as a result of that, St. Albans Bay actually doesn't freeze as consistently. So we also wanted to be sure that we had one shot at getting winter concentrations under ice. And we didn't know if we would even have ice cover that winter. So it was a bit of a gamble, but we did it. Um, and so here's uh, Vivian Taylor and Saul Blotcher. Vivian Taylor's a research scientist at Dartmouth. Saul Blotcher is a research technician at UVM. And you can get a glimpse of what it's like to conduct these studies on the lake ice. So it's got to freeze enough so that you can drive a truck onto it and bring all your gear. You have to drill a hole just like if you were going ice fishing. So you can send the gear down to collect water samples, um, which we did. So I mentioned before that the reason why there's not a whole lot of winter limnology is because it's hard to do. Um, this actually looks quite lovely when <laughs> you look at it. All the gears out there, nice, everything's organized and they're ready to go. Your hands freeze, they get really cold, um, it's hard to move. Your gear doesn't work as well, you know, so you have to figure out ways to warm up, um, you know, some of, some of your sampling gear. And it can be really um, challenging logistically. Also safety challenges, you know, you can't go out if the ice covers a little bit if you're worried about it. In, in any way. Um, so it's it's tricky. It's hard to even get consistent sampling. So we just wanted to keep it simple. This was a small scale study. We wanted to see is methylmercury even available in winter? We hypothesized yes. And then we also thought, well, maybe you might see methylmercury levels in the sediments or in the water increasing through the winter as anoxia develops under the ice. So I didn't explain this before, but what happens is that the ice cover creates kind of a physical barrier over the water so that you don't have that oxygen exchange with the water during that time. Um, and you don't have any wave action that would oxygenate the water too. So the longer the ice covers there and the thicker it is, the more of a depletion you get of that oxygen over time. So we collected a bunch of different types of samples. We wanted to look at methylmercury supply in the water column. Reason being, it's correlated with mercury levels in the food chain, so in zooplankton and fish. There are other studies that have um, demonstrated that. And so we collect water samples from uh, the bottom water, right above the sediments, and at the surface. And then we filter that water in the lab, so we got dissolved concentrations, which is what's kind of in that carboy there. Um, and that's the unbound dissolved methyl mercury. And then we also measured particulate methylmercury concentrations. Those are the concentrations of mercury that's bound to suspended particles, whether they be living phytoplankton or non-living matter. And you can see 
during different times of year, you can get lots of green phytoplankton or just kind of a lot of dead organic matter in there. But we measured the methyl mercury in those particulates. We also measured mercury in the sediments, which is a good indicator of supply, um, you know, because that's where a lot of the production is occurring. And then, of course, we measured all these water quality metrics, nutrient levels, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and a bunch of others. So now we're going to get into the results. Please, you know, ask questions. I mean, we can take questions at the end, but, um, you know, if there's anything really confusing, please um, feel free to interrupt. Um, so these are sediment concentrations of methylmercury in the two bays. This is Missisquoi Bay. This is St. Albans Bay over time. And so we're starting with September 2020, and then the blue shaded areas show the concentrations under ice cover, and then in the spring, and then going into the following fall. And what you can see is that in both bays, we saw detectable winter concentrations of methylmercury that were really well within the range of what we see the rest of the year. So we didn't not see any methylmercury. It's definitely there. We didn't see any increase in sediment concentrations under the ice cover, so we could um, already uh, reject that hypothesis. We saw higher concentrations of methylmercury in St. Albans Bay, but in both bays, it indicates that we have sustained methylmercury supply, um, even during the coldest winter months under ice. And so this is really contrast with conventional wisdom. And so if you want to look at the water column, which is a little bit more closely related to concentrations we see in biota, again, um, we see under ice cover, uh, actually we combine surface and bottom concentrations together for this analysis. We see um, detectable winter levels within the range of the rest of the year, significant seasonal differences. And we see in Missisquoi Bay, the highest concentrations of the dissolved methylmercury in wintertime. So that was a surprise. Um, in St. Albans Bay, we saw the opposite, the lowest concentration in wintertime, and higher levels in Missisquoi Bay um, compared to St. Albans Bay. So it's kind of the opposite of sediment. So it starts to get really complex. Now if you look at the particulates, again you see detectable levels that are within the range of the rest of the year. Similar concentrations between bays, um, still significant seasonal differences, but a lot of overlap in the concentrations in Missisquoi Bay. So just not a whole lot of change there. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's um, possible that in Missisquoi Bay, because it doesn't cycle into the ocean as much as St. Albans during the winter, that that needs to be more mercury yield? It might. Um, there are a lot of other factors, too, in that you get a lot of surface water inflows from the surrounding watershed as well. Um, so that, that might be part of the story. Um, so all, yeah, that, that's another thing. And yes, because it's a little bit more isolated, like you're saying, it doesn't have that exchange that it might be more of a pool of mercury. Um, but again, the sediment concentrations are, are a little bit higher in St. Albans Bay, so it, it gets a little, a little complicated. Um, and not as clear cut necessarily. Um, but it is very well mixed, so it's very shallow, which means that the water is constantly kind of turning over and exchanging, which might explain why you don't see, uh, you know, why you see overlap between these concentrations. Um, and you see the highest concentrations of particulate mercury in wintertime, um, which was surprising. So we kind of see these opposite patterns. When you put the water column uh, results all together, and looking at the winter time, you can see two different patterns emerging that methylmercury can be unbound in the dissolved phase in the Siskoi Bay, but it's bound to particulates in winter time in St. Albans Bay. So you get these distinct compartmentalization patterns even between two eutrophic systems. And so what's going on? Well, I mentioned all these other factors that we measure, dissolved oxygen, temperature, pH, these are things that we know to be generally important in terms of methylmercury fate. They're also all related to each other, so they can often be difficult to tease apart. But in our analysis to date, one factor that's really emerged as being important is the amount of total suspended solids. So the amount of particulates in the water column uh, 
in particular, the particulate methyl mercury concentration decreases the more suspended particles you have in the water column. That's a phenomenon known as biodilution. And so what was, we, we know that that happens a lot. You know, if you think about it, you've got methyl mercury in the system, it likes to attach to particles. The more particles you have, the more you can dilute the mercury among more particles, right? Um, but the highest particulate methyl mercury concentration we got occurred under ice when the water was clearest, right? That was in St. Albans Bay. So we see this kind of biodilution that can happen all through the year, but it depends on the ecosystem, the extent to which it happens. So if you look at this relationship just within each bay, you can see it. Um, but either way, it's you know we know that this particulate, these concentrations are related to methylmercury and zooplankton and fish. So we get this potential for trophic transfer even in winter time. Okay, so in terms of the field study, clearly both dissolved and particulate methylmercury can be highest even in winter compared to other seasons, which really contrasts with conventional wisdom. We, we thought that we may have results that basically show undetectable mercury in winter. We definitely did not see that. Um, but we get these differences in bays that um, are really complex um, and that wintertime methyl mercury can either be bound up to particles or in the dissolved phase, depending on the ecosystem and depending on the conditions. But either way, potential for year-round trophic transfer. And the factors that we can see so far explaining that seasonality and differences between the bays is that total suspended uh, solids, but there are other factors that are likely to play a role like dissolved oxygen, nutrient levels, and temperature, which I haven't shown you today, but um, so we'll, we'll kind of summarize and tie up those analyses soon, so to come. But the next step is to take these field uh, data and put them into a model that will allow us to predict changes in fish mercury levels in the future. So basically how this happens is that you've got, um, you know, seasonal variability in a couple different things. One is in mercury supply, right? So mercury in the water, and that's related to mercury in the prey, so zooplankton, right? We can calculate that. That, of course, is related to how much mercury we'll get into fish. But the other thing that's important that varies seasonally is temperature. So I didn't show you the results, but it can go from 2 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees in the summertime. And that temperature is strongly related to these, what we call bioenergetic rates. So consumption, uh, respiration, growth, all of those things increase and then decrease as temperature increases. And that growth is also important in determining the concentration of mercury in the body because it determines the total body weight. So we can plug in temperature and prey mercury levels in order to predict what the fish mercury levels would look like. And we can do this with a fish bioenergetics model 4.0, it's freely available. We can plug in water temperature over 365 days in the year. We can plug in zooplankton mercury concentrations as I described, and then compare the fish mercury levels at the end of that one year. And the questions that we want to address are, what's the current contribution of each season to the fish mercury level after one year based on current conditions. And then we can say, what about in the future? If, for example, winter looks more like spring, or instead of really having the winter time and four seasons, you have more like three seasons. And then what do fish mercury levels look like at that point? And then you can start talking about risks to people. So that's the next step. And now shifting toward thinking a little bit more about those risks. That's also been studied for decades. Um, more recently, I'd say a lot of the efforts here have tried to balance the risks with the benefits. So when I started in graduate school, it was all talking about mercury levels in fish, and which fish were high in mercury and which were low. Well, I'd say in the past uh, 10 years, it's shifted more to thinking about how fish mercury levels look relative to nutrients like omega-3 fatty acids and things like that. Um, and I think some of the most important efforts have to do with reducing confusion in consumption advisories because they're really complex. And a lot of times they don't agree with each other, 
Um, and most of those consumption advisories are targeted to people who buy fish, whether it's from a restaurant or from the store. They're often not targeted to people who go out and catch fish to feed themselves or their family. Um, and so in particular, very little is known about subsistence anglers, so people who rely um, sometimes heavily on fish that they or someone they know caught for food. So we need to know a little bit more about their fish collection and consumption habits and their need for informational resources. We don't know what they know and don't know um, and whether they have trouble and could use more access to healthy fish. Um, so just because we know that our consumption advisories are targeted to different groups, we know that there are these other groups who are underserved. And I know this because uh, a few years ago, I worked on, um, through Stony Brook, a seafood mercury database that helped to inform a lot of these consumption guides. Um, and so some of them you may recognize, this was actually in collaboration with the Environmental Defense Fund, which was great. Uh, Monterey Bay Seafood Guide uses our seafood uh, database, but they're all based on basically store-bought or, or restaurant type of fish. So we wanted to know a little bit more about local anglers. Um, we conducted this online survey targeting anglers in the Lake Champlain region. We advertised it through fishing community forums and um, at boat launches and piers. And our goals were to assess the local consumption patterns and their needs. We wanted to help try to assess their risk, but also we knew that this was kind of a, a pilot study, first of its kind, and we didn't know if we could reach subsistence anglers, so we figured if we failed doing that, at least we could talk to other researchers and tell them how they might be able to do it better. Um, because it's challenging. We know from other studies that subsistence anglers in other parts of the world are pretty rare or just hard to even um, find to kind of take these surveys. And so we didn't know if we could reach them. So, but we did, um, and we did find that subsistence anglers were rare among our respondents. We had the survey open for two and a half months in the summer. We got 278 responses. And the, one of the first questions we asked is, why do you go fishing? And so there were kind of two groups. This is one way you could look at the responses. In one group, there were 42 or 15% of respondents who said that they fish to feed themselves or their family. They could also say they fish for fun as well, but these were the folks who, who mentioned feeding themselves or their family as a reason. There were 232 or 83% that didn't mention that as a reason. They primarily fish for fun. Um, and so these two groups just kind of operationally, we felt was convenient to look at just based on those different intentions do we see differences in those groups. The um, caveat though is that this question doesn't assess their reliance on eating fish and how much fish they're eating that they catch. So that's important to keep in mind. And so when you look at the numbers, we see lots of differences, but if you look at them statistically based on chi-square tests, you see mostly similarities between groups. So the, but for both groups, they most commonly catch and eat um, trout and perch. Most of them, 80%, are aware of consumption advisories. That's a pretty high level of awareness, although there's still that 20% that we, we think need to be reached out to. They all um, prefer to receive information from bait and tackle shops, signs at, at fishing areas, and from government agencies. They both um, have similar frequencies of the parts of fish consumed, with mussel or fillet being the most common. Um, and their frequencies of both total fish as well as self-caught fish were statistically the same. Um, so, interest, so here's kind of a, an example of what I'm talking about. Mo the most common response for recreational anglers was two to three times a month that they eat fish, both self-caught and total. For subsistence, it's a little bit more frequent, once a week. So the number is higher for subsistence anglers, but it's not statistically significant because we just don't didn't have that many respondents. Um, so we know that these subsistence anglers intend to fish to feed themselves and their family, but they could end up consuming similar amounts as recreational anglers. So we can't make any assumptions about individuals just based on one response. We did see, though, that among the subsistence anglers, um, six or 14% we had 
lower than expected individuals ages 18 to 34 year olds. So not as many of the younger age bracket and more of the income of less than 35,000 per year in the subsistence payers. And this um, lower income group is understudied and of note because in my work and some of my colleagues, we've shown that higher mercury exposure like blood concentrations in humans is strongly related to higher income. Um, however, we didn't look at these lower income individuals. So there may be those who have higher mercury exposure too, we just haven't studied them. We did see clear differences in their seasonal fishing habits. So a greater percentage of subsistence anglers say that they go fishing often, once a week or more in each season compared to the recreational. So subsistence is in the green, recreational is in the orange. And if you look at it statistically and kind of break it out further based on whether they said often, sometimes, rarely, never, um, you can see that the arrows show the statistical significance um, where a higher percentage of subsistence anglers fish often in winter and in spring compared to the recreational anglers. And so one of the goals was to bring this information to other researchers and also community groups. And in doing so, I learned that this pattern is consistent with indigenous fishing practices. So fish caught in winter apparently are preferred, at least according to kind of Abenaki culture, which is an indigenous um, tribe in New England in general, but um, in particular in the Lake Champlain region. And apparently the fish that are caught in winter are firmer and they taste better and they're just easier to catch. Um, and what they will do in, in terms of the kind of cultural practices is that they'll catch the fish and freeze them in the lake water and um, kind of thaw them out to eat during different times of the year. So it's a little bit different paradigm than thinking about, but summertime, it's warm, it's time to go fishing, collect all your fish then, which is kind of, I think, what we assume people do, but not always the case. And so the question is, well, what does that mean in terms of risk, right? Um, so subsistence anglers, we know they catch and eat fish in winter more often than recreational anglers. Does that translate to higher risk? We don't really know. Um, but I also want to point out that these surveys have limitations. Um, it's kind of a really easy tool to dispense as a researcher, but uh, you know the information you get is all self-reported. The sample sizes that we got for subsistence anglers were low, and so they all need confirming. But um, the recommendation that we have been making from this study to our colleagues is to conduct interviews um, and work with specific communities that could have subsistence anglers in them because that yields more insight. I mean, just that information about we prefer fish that are caught in winter was probably one of the most insightful pieces of information that we got. And it wasn't from the survey, it was from talking with people about it. So in general, we found from the study that yes, methylmercury supply in the water column is sustained through the winter. It can be higher compared to other seasons. So this is going on year round. It doesn't shut down in the winter. Um, and so what's the next step? We need to compare it with other ecosystem factors to understand what the controls are, but to make predictions based on uh, you know, future climate scenarios to understand what are fish gonna look like in terms of their quality uh, in 10 years, 20 years. Uh, we know that subsistence anglers consume winter caught fish more often than recreational anglers. That was coincidental. Yes, this was a winter mercury study. We found out that subsistence anglers eat more fish in winter. Weren't expecting it. Does it translate to greater risk of exposure? That's a good question. I'd be happy to discuss that. But there's lots of future work to do. Uh, we need a lot more extensive study, for example, on additional lakes and ecosystems. Um, you know, we looked at two basins in Lake Champlain, and that's it. There's a lot more work to do. Um, and we need a lot more intensive study just on the winter uh, because it's hard to do that consistent seasonal sampling. You know, we had funding to do something like eight sampling time points, and that maxed it out. Um, but we need we need more. Um, and also to look at bioaccumulation in biota. We didn't even look at that. So uh, lots more work to do. Um, and also to look a little bit more about this issue on seasonal fish collection habits and consumption. 
and does that translate to different risks? So I absolutely have to thank my collaborators on this project, Andrew Schropp at UVM, Vivian Taylor at Dartmouth. They are really, um, were impressive in being able to pull this together uh, right when the pandemic hit and to be able to go out and take these measurements um, in what ended up being great that it was a hard winter um, <laughs> because we needed that ice cover to measure what we wanted. But um, you know, they, they seem to surmount every single challenge. Um, we also have collaborators on uh, just kind of the outreach with the Angler Survey, Chris Stepanuck at Lake Champlain Sea Grant, UVM, Maureen Murphy, who's here at Stony Brook, um, and lots of research support from our technicians, Celia Chen, and of course funding support from Lake Champlain Sea Grant and from SOMA here at Stony Brook, which we would not have been able to do any of this were it not for that. So um, thanks to them and thank you for your attention. Really do appreciate it. So any question for Father Tolini? How often do you do um, research projects like this where you're combining the scientific study with the other methods, the surveys, and possibly interviews? Is that something you're used to or can do for you? Um, I'd say that the, you know, kind of the interview and the survey piece as a component has grown in my own research um, over time. Uh, it used to be that people would kind of tack that on as an afterthought to some extent to their research uh, for whatever reason, lack of resources, or that just wasn't focused. But I think it's probably true that it's not just me that there's been more of an effort to do that. I think it's um, kind of overdue uh, to have those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And the survey itself, I, I think, you know, I, anyone who wants to do a similar study, and there are um, colleagues of mine who are kind of branching off from this, I would say, please don't do another survey. Like, we've had enough surveys. <laughs> we need to be thinking a little bit more creatively about what to do with the information we have and how to reach subsistence anglers who are going out and catching fish. I don't know if I remember the word, but I think you said so most ladies in the world are now eutrophic. Yes. And so, what was, like, what was the other word? Oligotrophic. Oligotrophic? Yes. Yes. So, the so lakes that are oligotrophic, um, where are they located? Is this because they're not near farm runoff? Is that the main? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> there are also some parts of the world where they tend to be a little bit more common because of. Uh, just kind of the environmental characteristics and geologic history and things like that. Um, but yeah, in general, the the fact that it's more common to have um, those kind of eutrophic, nutrient polluted lakes is all from, for the most part, agriculture. Yeah. And and, and Lake Champlain, you said the northern was more. So there's more agriculture in the north. That's yes. I just left it more mountainous in the, in the southern area? Um, it's, it's just, well, I, I, I think that's a good question. I think that there's just, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's more mountainous. Um, I think that it has to do also with kind of the watershed and the inflows into the lake, yeah. um, but also the location of agriculture relative to the lake. And it just, just so happens that in the north, that tends to be more of a problem there than in the yeah. south part of the lake. Yeah. Yep. And you can ask me questions about fish too, like what fish are good to eat and stuff like that. Too. So. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's very really interesting. So before the presentation, we kind of talk about right. So um, what about your diet now? It's my diet. <laughs> yeah. How you see it? When I was. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was studying not just mercury, but a whole range of heavy metals, and some of them are actually essential nutrients that are good for you at low, low levels, but then they can be toxic at high doses. But the mercury part, there was part of my work that was on mercury, but I just started lo looking at it, and I didn't eat any fish because I thought, why would you? It's, you know, <laughs> it has mercury in it. Um, and then as I started to do, when I came to Stony Brook first as a postdoc, uh, I 
led this uh, kind of human health study that looked at human exposure um, for people who eat fish on Long Island um, and their, their seafood consumption habits and stuff. And the more that I looked at human exposure and the nutrient levels, the more the concern for mercury diminished. Um, and so I actually ended up eating more fish over time uh, because I, I guess I just kind of got used to the idea <laughs> that, and, but I also felt like I had the information. I knew which fish were really high in mercury and which, which fish are much lower. Um, so yeah. So when, when we think of fishing in lakes or streams, am I correct in remembering that states are really, uh, environmental agencies are more in charge of that? Yes. So do they reach out to these angler sites and so forth and really disseminate information? That's an excellent question. So yeah, the states really are um, kind of in charge of uh, providing consumption advisories for specific water bodies mm -hmm. in their state. And so that can be, it, for the most part, it's fresh water, but for some coastal states, it can also be coastal fish too. And um, yeah, they all have their own consumption advice, but very few of them, for example, translate their consumption advice into different languages. Um, one of the things that I think could be improved on, some do, mm -hmm. and it's improving, but not, not enough. And, and we know it's needed, so it's kind of like, okay, come on, you know, do you want to wait another 10 years before you start translating this stuff? Also, um, you know, even me, like, I consider myself, um, you know, having lots of access to information, right? And <laughs> as a researcher, for sure, but even just as a consumer, I don't even look up stuff like that on the internet or things. And so I, I think that um, that's how a lot of the information is made available. It would be much better if, for example, you went to go fish at a stream and there was a sign there. Right there. And it didn't have the name of the fish, just a picture of it. Because a lot of people, they catch fish, and this is true for Long Island too. It's not just, you know, in the rural areas of the country. They don't know what the fish is called. They just know that they catch it and how it tastes. You know, and, and so you need information that's, you know, people get it when they need it. Sign and look. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, right. It kind of point of consumption type of signage, right? I mean, that's that's similar to what you get. Uh, we're we're all bombarded with so much information that I think it makes a whole lot of sense to give people information when they need it, um, and that's one way. So, but yes, the states are really um, kind of in control in terms of local water bodies and the information that um, we give relative to that. They used to say, I, when you were saying, when there was all this, like a lot of the messaging about mercury and fish, you know, don't eat swordfish, don't eat tuna, the, the larger fish, because it takes longer to accumulate. Is that still sort of the case? Yes, okay. it is. And, you know, when I talked about how simplifying consumption advice is really important, that's one way um, I, some of you may have uh, heard of Carl Safina, who's in SOMAS too, he's a researcher here. And one way that he describes it to people is to say, if the fish can fit on your plate, it's probably safe to eat in terms of the mercury because it's small enough. Um, most people though, when they buy fish, it's just a part of it. So you don't know how big the thing was, but if it's swordfish or tuna, it probably was pretty big compared to like, smelt or you know, much much smaller species but yes body size is hugely important yeah well thanks for coming out on a rainy day appreciate it if you have other questions too that's my email address if something you know, comes to mind later on don't hesitate to reach out thank you all thank you.